So today, we're going to wrap up this series called The In Commandments. And I've, I've really enjoyed this. I don't know about you guys, but I've learned a lot through this series. And if, if you've missed any of it, especially, uh, we kind of tied it together with the last series. So it's all kind of like, almost like two series combined into one. So if, if you missed any of it, go back to, or go, to, go online to sp.church and click on our, our latest messages, and you can find all the messages that we've had and, and catch up. It's a good way to, to connect and stay connected with the community of faith because we have, um, I don't know how many people go to this church. It's quite a few as far as all the campuses, and it's amazing to think that we're all on the same page. We're all learning the same stuff and, and what an impact that can have for the kingdom. So the, the premise of the In Commandments. Well, what we're talking about here is right after the, the resurrection, Jesus comes back to life, and, and kind of what, what happened and what he taught after that. And it's pretty cool, but what he did when he came back is, is simply he showed up and he said, hey, here's the deal. I'm going to start something brand new. We're going we're gonna to establish a new gathering, a new, new thing on this planet, and that thing is called the church. It's the church for the entire world, not just the Gentiles, but he taught, taught them to go out into the whole world. So God's changed things. He wanted to have a covenant between everyone. A covenant is just a contract or a promise for everyone in the world. So as he's, you know, on, on this earth, you know, practicing his, his ministry, he's out there, he's teaching, he's healing, he's, he's pulling off miracles left and right. He's going into the, the sanctuary and flipping over tables because he doesn't want it to be a money-changing place. And, you know, you've heard or read all the stories about what Jesus did throughout his life. And everybody's like, yeah, this is the guy. This is the man we've been waiting for, the Messiah. Yes. And then what happens? He dies. And they're all like, what? <laughs> What's going on? He can't die. What? Is this not right? What's going on? But, you know, everything Jesus taught, everything he was teaching was just nothing. He died. But we all know the, the, the end of the story, right? Or most of us, if you, if you don't, you need some catching up. But, but he came back to life. He rose again on the third day, and when he did that, he validated every single thing he taught, everything he did, all the miracles that happened. He validated all of that. He punctuated that with a big, giant exclamation mark. He comes back to life, and he's like, what up, bro? What's, what's next? That's in there. You should find it. Dig it up. No, I made that part up, too. So when he comes back to life, he gathers all his followers together, and he's like, hey, here's, here's the deal. I want you guys to go out into the world, not just the Gentiles or not just the Jews, but all of the world, the Gentiles, and that's most of us, unless you're Jewish in here, that's everybody. And they did it. They went out and they told everybody everything that Jesus taught them, and, and we're here today because of that. Go into the entire world. You know what he also told him? He says, while you're doing that, I will be with you. And he's with us today, right here, right now. And as he's teaching this, and he tells them that he'll be with them, and they're out there in the whole world, he did all this to keep it under this one big umbrella, this overarching command that he gave everybody. And that command was to love one another the way that I have loved you. It's all about that. It's all about love, loving one another, love your neighbor. Now, for the disciples, you know, that wasn't a lot to go on because after he told them this, he went, he beat feet. Jesus said, I'm going back to see dad, and he went to heaven. And now the disciples, here's what they got. They have some of the teachings that he had, some of the parables that he had. They remembered all the miracles that they could talk about and run around. But what they didn't have was they didn't have uh, a New Testament. They didn't have the writings of Paul. You know, the St. Paul, the guy that the church is named after, he, he did a whole bunch of writings in the Bible. But he didn't do that for 25 to, to 30 years later. So in that 25, 30 year span, all they had was the stuff that they remembered, the stuff that they, Jesus taught them. So they go out and they reach the entire world with the one command that he gave them that, that really punctuates everything, to love one another. That's what he did. That's all they had. But with just that little bit of information, they changed the world. Because had they not changed the world, had they not done what they said, we would all be at home right now. I don't know. We wouldn't be wearing chief shirts. We'd hardly all be wearing chief shirts. just hanging out watching TV today. We wouldn't be here. But that's what this is all about. So in this series, we're going to step back a little bit. And we're going to look at what did Jesus really, what, what did he teach them after he came back? What did he tell them about? And we're going to talk about things, what, what he told them not to do. And that's where the end comes from. He, Jesus said to, to fear not, to worry not. Jesus said to sin not, to judge not. 
Now, in hearing those, if you haven't been with us for the whole series and you hear those things and it's kind of like, that, those are impossible things. That's very unrealistic for us to, to fear not, to judge not, to do all these things. That's hard to do, but it makes a lot of sense after the resurrection. You see, the first century followers had that kind of aha moment. They were like, wait a minute. Everything he's taught us, you know, this man told us, now that we kind of see it and we figure it out, he told us this was going to happen. He predicted his own, you know, ministry and his life, and he predicted that he was going to die, and he told him he's going to raise again. And then you know what he did? He pulled it off. And here they are, they're like, maybe there's something to this guy. Maybe there's something about living in the light and the fact that we have seen a risen Savior. All of those disciples, all of the apostles, they saw him alive. Hundreds of people did. Now, the end command, what we're going to talk about today is doubt not. I know that's hard. Sometimes we always doubt, but I'm I'm going to dig into this doubt not a lot today. And I want you guys to to spend some time on on your programs. There's a place for some notes. Write down some stuff. There's a study guide that uh, I don't think, I think we're out of them out front, but you can download this online and print it out at home. But it's a great way to dig into God's word. Okay. And I, I know I say this a lot every week. Don't just take my word for it. It's it's not about what I tell you. It's about what God's trying to tell you. Spend time in God's word and, and try to hear from him. You know, use this study guide with your, with your family and your friends and your life groups. Just, just dig into it and see what God's telling you. Maybe that what I say today and what you find on your own could be for you or it could be for a family member, maybe some a, a coworker. You never know when God's gonna use you to reach out and tell people about him. And talking about that, as far as doubt not, Every now and then, you know, I know I'm a new pastor. I don't know how long, about, I don't even know how long it's been now. Anyway, a couple years. But uh, I, every now and then I get people will say, ooh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that in front of you once they figure out I'm a pastor, you know. You, you've done it a few times. But, um, <laughs> but every now and then they'll, they'll come to me and they're like, hey, uh, can I talk to you? They'll kind of look around. Can, can I talk to you? And I know when they ask you that and they're looking around like that, it's going to be about sex or, or doubt. But um, they'll say something like, do you ever have doubts? And I'll look them straight in the eye, and I'm kind of like, no. And if you do, you're going to go straight to hell. You better not do that. There, don't be doubting, all right? No, I don't say that. Of course I have doubts, right? We all have doubts. It's not like I decide to doubt. It just kind of sneaks up on it and grabs you. That's everybody. So what I tell them is, is sin is not, or doubt is not a sin, and it's okay to doubt. What the big deal is, is is what you do with that doubt. Okay, when you start to doubt, when you start to worry, it's what you do. And I like how Andy Stanley points it out. He says this, when um, when doubt, or we doubt when we wonder, is, is it worth it or is it true? Is it worth it or is it true? When we start to doubt, that's kind of what we're thinking. Is it really worth it to make all these sacrifices in my life that God calls me to, to do? that Jesus teaches us to do? Is it really worth it to to do the things that Jesus did, to do it his way? Is it really worth it to surrender everything to God, to give it all to him and then hope and pray that, that, you know, he knows what he's doing? Is it really worth it? Or, you know, and as we start to dig through that, is it worth it, is it worth it? We start to wonder, is it true? Is it really true? Is there really a good God up there somewhere, this master of the universe kind of guy? Is Jesus really, was he, was he really a real person? These are things we start to wonder. Is it true? Can I rely on Scripture? Especially when, you know, when we're young, we're in, we're in high school, or, or we're getting ready to go into college, you know, we first time away from home, and we start to hear other thoughts and, and things and, and worldviews and stuff like that, and then we start to doubt, or, or it's easy for students to start to doubt and wonder. And sometimes they skip about that, is it worth this stuff, and go right to, is it true? Because if they can decide that it's not true, they don't got to worry about all that, is it worth it stuff? Because if they decide it's not true, they can just move on and do what they do. Now, I know we all struggle with doubt, and it's hard. And sometimes we don't know what to do. We don't know what's going to happen next. But it, like I said, it's, it's how we deal with and handle the doubt. Now, here's some good news for you, because 100% of the first century followers of Christ, they all doubted. Every single one of them. The men and the women that followed Jesus, they all doubted. The men and the women that were with Jesus and actually performed some of the miracles out there, they were doing the miracles, and they doubted. They wondered, is it worth it? Is it true? 
They were scared. That's crazy, isn't it, to think the disciples that, that we talk about so much, Jesus, that we talk about, all of the 12 disciples, Jesus' closest friends, they doubted. Now, who's the most famous doubter of them all? Thomas, right? That's what we think of when we think doubters, you know, or thinking about doubt. Oh, doubting Thomas, he's the only one. No, every single one of them doubted. They all doubted him so much that they abandoned him in the moment that most likely he needed them most. When they come and took him, they abandoned him. So here's some great news for all you doubters out there. And I'm not going to make you raise your hand or have you raise your hand, but if you doubt, just know and understand that Jesus doesn't toss you out if you doubt. That's got to be comforting. That's got to be good to know. In fact, he, what he wants us to know is that we can follow Jesus and have doubt. We can follow Jesus and have questions. God is bigger than our questions. God is bigger than our doubt. We can follow Jesus and not understand exactly how things are going to work out. It's okay. It really is. But here's why it's a big deal. Here's what Jesus also knew when we talk about doubt. Jesus said, but doubt can take you out. This is what he knew. If, if you don't deal with, with your doubt in the right way, it can take you out of the picture altogether. And this is why throughout Jesus' ministry, over and over and over, he taught to those that he loved. He says, do not doubt, because doubt will take you out. Now, let me, let me tell you a story about a guy. You may know of him. You may have heard of him. The guy's name's Peter. Now, Peter doubted. There was a time where, and we talked about this in the last series a couple times, but where, where the disciples are in the boat and they're out in the Sea of Galilee and they're rowing. Jesus said, hey, go row to the other side. And they're out there and they're rowing and rowing and rowing. The storms are crashing and water's coming in the boat. They're freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? They keep rowing and then they realize and they look out into the, into the water and they see this somebody walking across. At first they thought it was a ghost, but the closer they got, then they realized, oh, it's Peter or it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And Peter's is like, Hey, Jesus, if it's really you, call me out and call me to you. What does Peter do? Boom. He hops out and jumps in the boat as soon as Jesus calls. He starts walking on that water. That's, that's amazing, right? He was watching. He had his eyes on Jesus, and he's walking and walking, but then a little water splashes him. He's kind of, oh, is it? oh wait, whoa, whoa, what am I doing? And then he starts to sink. Down into the water he goes, right? Splash. Here's what scripture, how they describe that. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Isn't that a great prayer? I think I pray that all the time. Lord, save me. Lord, save me for myself. Lord, save me, save me, save me. This is so important for us to get Peter's doubt and how he responded or how Jesus responded to Peter's doubt. This is what Jesus said. He said, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Should have brought you some floaties, brother. That's what he said. There should be a slide for that, right? No, I just made that part up. Here's what he says. He says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Could you imagine Jesus? Oh, here he comes. Here he comes. He's doing it. He's doing, oh, come on. Here, come here. Why did you doubt? You had it. You made it. So as soon as Peter begins to doubt, Jesus reaches out and catches him. And he says to Peter, why did you doubt? And you got to give Peter a huge prop because he stepped out of the boat. Nobody else did. He walked on water. He saw all the waves and then he became afraid and he started to sink. And I think sometimes this is us. We'll take that first step of faith. We'll jump out of the boat. But then, then we start to look at our circumstances. And we start to look at the world around us and what happens. We start to doubt. We have fear, and we let that creep in, and we sink. So last week, we asked out on Facebook, if you, if you, you know, what were some of the doubts that you're having in your life? So what are some of the struggles that you're having with doubt? And this one lady, and, and we, she, she gave us permission to talk about this, but she shared that her and her husband had gone through six deaths in the last year. That's a lot of pain and grief, isn't it? Six deaths. She had three. Three miscarriages. She had a a loss of a parent, a grandparent, and a best friend. All in in a year span, she couldn't help but doubt. Can you imagine that? That's just, I could, it's unbearable sometimes to think about what kind of pain that is when the waves of life and death and disappointment start to crash in on us and the pain starts hitting us. It's easy for us to start to think, I'm not sure Jesus is going to do anything. 
I'm not sure Jesus is going to hold me up because this hurts. I don't know if I can take it anymore. I don't know if it's worth it. These waves of life, these winds of life, and they are scary and they are painful. Can you imagine? Peter's sinking, but Jesus grabs him and says, why did you doubt? Because suddenly, this is what Peter says back to this, because I realized the water, I'm walking on the water, Jesus. I'm still, in, I could see you over there, but I'm in the storm, Jesus. I feel the water, I feel the waves, I feel the pressure, I feel the pain. I, I just don't know. I don't know how it's gonna work out. And Jesus is like, that's okay. You can have doubt. Cannot know what's going to happen next, but you just cannot give in to doubt because doubt will take you out. See, it's okay to doubt because it's not a choice. The question is, will you allow your doubt to convince you it's not worth it? It's not true. So you give up too soon. That can happen if you let it. So here's, here's another situation about the, all the disciples. They're all there. They're with Jesus, right? They're on this hillside, and there's thousands of people out there, thousands of them. And then Jesus is teaching, and they're doing miracles, and people are loving it, and it's amazing. And then they decide, the crowds, the, the disciples are like, hey, the, let's send these people away, man. They are hungry. It's getting close to dinner time. There's no food out here. And what does Jesus say? He says, you feed them. He says, you feed them. And, and, and so they do. They feed these thousands of people. And it's amazing. And they're loving it, right? And they're eating it up. And it's like, it's great. We got, ooh, it's free food. It's free food. I mean, who doesn't like free food? I think they're a bunch of Methodists. I say free food around here. People come out of the woodwork. So it's crazy. They were all wanting this free food. They wanted what Jesus had to offer them. But then Jesus tried to teach a lesson here. He said, the bread that I give you, the water that I give you, you're going to still be hungry. You're still going to be thirsty. This is physical stuff that I give you. What I'm trying to teach you is about the bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. And he says, I tell you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, he's trying to tell him about physical, you know, physical bread, physical drink, and how that's temporary. But what he's offering is forever, is eternal and lasting. I'm giving you myself. I'm giving you my life. Now, he's speaking metaphorically, but, but the audience there is so literal. And they're looking at him like, what did he just say? Did he say eat him, eat him, his flesh, drink his blood? There's people out there in the audience that, that don't even like Jesus anyway. They're kind of following him around just to get that mean quote or that mean tweet that they can get. So they start tweeting, Jesus is a cannibal. He wants us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And it's out there all over Facebook. It's crazy. They actually had to delete that guy's account because it just went crazy. But this is what this guy, Jesus, his men are with him and his disciples are with him. And they're kind of thinking, oh, what are you saying, Jesus? That's a little crazy. Is it worth it? Is it true? And then one of the, the, the guys, the eyewitnesses that were there, he says, on hearing this, many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now the disciples left, and the 12 that were there that, that stuck around, that, you know, they're looking at all these people starting to leave. And they're wondering, right? You have the 12 apostles that are there, and, and, <laughs> and they're thinking, man, we've been like rock stars for almost a year now. We've been following Jesus around, and people treat us like we're awesome. And now all of a sudden, Jesus is talking a little crazy. And people are like, ooh, I don't know about that. I don't, mm -mm. Jesus has said some crazy stuff before. The disciples are kind of like, ooh, I don't know. Is it worth it? Is it worth it the things that, that Jesus is asking us to do, eat my flesh and drink my blood? Is it, is it true? So the, the crowds are starting to slip away, and the disciples think, all we got to do is kind of back up into that crowd, and we're gone, right? This is where they're at, but Jesus says, turns to them. He knows what, this is what's crazy. He knows what they're thinking. Nobody went to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, we're out, right? But Jesus knows what they're thinking, and he says this. He turns to the 12, and, and maybe he turns to you today, and he says, here, look me in the eye. And he says, you don't want to leave too, do you? You want to leave too, do you? You're going to turn your back on me? <laughs> and they do want to leave. But they have no idea what Jesus has in store for their life. What they have in the balance if they allow their, their, their doubt to take them out. This is a make or break moment. This is how history unfolds 
and it's going to unhinge things in that manner. If they decide to let doubt take them out, had they done that? Had they done that? You guys heard of, of Peter, James, and John, and all those guys? How many of you have, like, your first name or your middle name is Peter, James, or John? We got some Johns out there. There's one. Everybody at that service, they did that too. It's like they're scared to let people know their name. And we're going to have a name tag Sunday just so you know, so give that up. Go ahead, raise it up there real big and proud. Okay, don't. All right, so anyway, these guys, we would have known them. Some of you would have different names had these guys let doubt take them out. Scary to think that way. But in the midst of that, they say this, John says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? In the book of John, Peter's like, Jesus, we can't leave you. To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Who, who else is there? Think about it. I want you guys to say that. To whom shall we go? Say it with me. To whom shall we go? All right, that was good. Now I want you to change something. I want you to change the, the we to I. To whom shall I go? That's a little more personal. That's a little more personal. That's the kind of question that cuts through the fog of, is it worth it? Is it true? You see, doubt can lead, to, lead us to curiosity, or, or, and, and curiosity can lead us to discovery, and those are great things. We need that, to have a little bit of doubt and start figuring things out and then come up with some new and extraordinary thing. But if we don't do the right things and we let doubt kind of take us out of the picture, we need to look at it through a different set of, set of lenses. We need to ask that question, if not Jesus, then who? Because we're all going to follow somebody. We're all going to follow something, or if not Jesus, what? We're all going to replace that with something. Here's the thing. Doubt whispers, is it true? And Jesus whispers, if not me, then who? But then Peter says this thing, and this is extraordinary and powerful. You need to kind of maybe even write this one down. But, and the whole group knew this, but they were scared and they were doubting. They didn't know if it was true or not. And he says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. To you, to whom shall we go? We're not sure of all this stuff you're talking about, eat your flesh and all that, Jesus. I'm not really sure about that. I don't know what you're saying. You know, but I'm not sure about the, the sacrifices that you're asking us to make. I'm not sure if it's worth it. You know, and I don't know if it's really sure exactly true or how this is all gonna work out, Jesus. But I do know one thing. And that is that nobody, nobody has loved us the way you love us. Nobody has spoken clearer to us and explained things better than you. Nobody has demonstrated more power or more compassion than you. So we're not going anywhere, Jesus. We're going to follow you. We put our trust in you. To whom shall we go? And Jesus answered him and he said this, you ain't seen nothing yet, bro. That's in John chapter, no, I'm just kidding. I made that part up too. I think that's kind of what he was thinking though. He's like, Jesus, guys, you have no idea what I'm going to do with you. You have no idea what I'm going to do in and through your lives. You are going to become superheroes. I mean, people are going to name their children after you. You're going to write best-selling books, and you're going to be the number one book in the world forever and ever and ever, right? It's crazy. You have no idea. You are going to see things that people have only dreamed about. If you let doubt take you out, though, man. You're going to shape the entire world if you just stick with me. But they didn't know that. All they knew in that moment is the same thing that you and I know is that I'm not sure if it's worth it, but to whom shall I go? I'm not sure if it's true, but to whom shall I go? What else is there? And then after the resurrection of Jesus, these guys that were all doubting and were like, I don't know, Jesus, we might slip into the crowd and beat feet, man. We got to get out of here. You're, you, you lost it. You're off your rocker a little bit, Jesus. I don't know. These guys that were getting ready to run, they became their loudest shouters. They were telling everybody about Jesus. They told everybody about Jesus so much so that, that we're standing here today. We're sitting here today talking about Jesus. What changed? They went from doubting this guy to, well, oh, I don't know, man, I don't know, to, to being the, the biggest supporters ever. 
They changed the entire world. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have Jesus at the time. They, all they saw or all they knew was that Jesus came back from the dead. He was a living, living risen Lord. They became bold and unafraid to share Jesus with everybody and everywhere. And they knew it was true, and they knew it was worth it because they saw Jesus come back from the dead. They were, I wonder if they're thinking, you know, back to that time on the hillside, man, remember back then when we were thinking about leaving? We were this close to losing it all. What it was is the foundation of their faith has become the foundation of our faith. It wasn't teaching. It wasn't miracles that Jesus did. It's the resurrection of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for each and every one of us, right? And he rose again. That's who we follow. We follow a risen. It's not a book. It's not a title. It's, it's, it's an event, the event of Jesus' resurrection. You know, if we let doubt take us out, we will never know what he has in store for you. You'll never know what he has in store for your grandkids, or for you. You're never going to know. If you let doubt take you out, you're never ne- going to know what God had planned to do with your life. Who are you going to go to? Who are you going to call? You're never going to know how God, how God could bless your business, your relationships, your marriage, your family, your future children, your future grandchildren. Remember, we don't, we don't choose doubt. We don't go looking for it. It just kind of shows up. And in those moments, you have to ask the question that Peter asked. To whom shall we go? I'm not sure it's worth it right now. I'm not sure it's all true, but to whom shall I go? In that question, the seeds of faith are sprinkled in and and they are strong and they will grow and they will carry you through the difficult times. I hope you move into the the master plan for God has a plan for each and every one of us, right? God has a plan for our lives. Remember that one we talked about in the beginning that that had those struggles, all those deaths in the last year, those six losses that her family faced. We asked her, she said, what got her through the pain and through the questions, through the doubts, is seeking God, praying for understanding, trusting that God is holding them up and seeking the light instead of the darkness. How easy is it when we're struggling and we're in pain and and want want to just push everybody away, don't talk to me, leave me alone, and just kind of sneak, sneak away? kind of like those disciples, blend into the crowd and disappear. How easy is it for us to just let go? And what we need to do is seek God and follow what he says. Who else could we turn to? Who else? See, Jesus says in many ways to trust me, reach out for me, hold on to me. And you know what else he says? Even if you can't or don't have the strength to hold on to me, I'm gonna hold on to you. That's what Jesus tells us. He loves us. He says, I will never let you go. I got you. No matter what life throws at you, no matter what, how dark it may seem or what you got going through, Jesus says, don't doubt. I'm here. I got you. Well, that's the end commandments, all five of them. Five commandments that, that don't make any sense until after the resurrection Because we know when he comes back from life, we can reach out and we can tap into that power that he has of the Holy Spirit to guide us and help us through those difficult times. Fear not, even when there's something to be afraid of. Sin not, because God will, will not sin not because God's gonna get you, but because your Savior loved you enough to die for you. And we know that every sin comes with its own prepackaged kind of consequences, Right? We understand that there are consequences for our choices. Worry not, because your heavenly Father knows exactly what you need. He's gonna give you exactly what you need for each day, and judge not, because God loves us so much, right? We are not to size people up and write them off. We're not to size people up and walk away and leave them in their sin and leave them in their struggles. We're called to be better than that. We're called to help them. And last but not least, doubt not. Because you have no idea what God's going to do in your life and through your life if you let sin take you out or doubt take you out. Jesus commanded all of these things under the canopy 
love one another as I have loved you. Validated and punctuated that with his resurrection, him coming back to life. That's what Jesus did. And I just wonder, and I wonder, what would it look like if we were all to embrace this? What would it look like if we all said, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to go and use the power and the faith of the Holy Spirit and live this out in our lives. I think it would change the world. It did once. I think it'll do it again. The Ten Commandments, and for today, that is the good news in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.